Um, I am going to take the first question, though, from our, our audience, um, and, and in the hope that it encourages other members of our audience to maybe also post some questions. Uh, otherwise, we'll just ask each other questions. But it would be great to hear some more questions from the audience. So the first question has come from Andrew Planet, and he's asked, with increasing global demand for farmed aquatic produce, is there any worldwide legal consensus towards preventing escaped invasive species causing ecosystem collapse? Now, there's a huge amount in that question, so I think there's probably something, something, a little bit of something for everybody there. Um, Let's let's try, Elisa. Do you want to have a go at that first? Thinking about the legal consensus, is is there any legal consensus here? So there is legal consensus, and under the Convention on Biological Diversity, we have obligations to prevent uh, and mitigate uh, invasive, you know, the spread of invasive alien species. We have guidance, um, but we also have identified barriers, and some have to do with international trade. Others have to do with particular technical regulation of, say, um, fishing vessels or other ways in which invasive alien species spread. So we have consensus, but implementation is an issue. And, and once again, connecting steps in preventing and mitigating, as well as then working on restoration, are crucial. Thanks. Carol? Yeah, I'd like to follow on from that, Eliza, because uh, Certainly when we talk about algae, there's a big problem with ships ballast, ballast water containing alien or invasive, potentially invasive species. And for sure, ballast water has caused a big change in populations of algae throughout the world. Mm. And many of these species that are, well, not many, but this, it can cause big problems with harmful algal blooms. Um, so where there are harmful algal blooms, it can often be related back to um, algae that have been, I mean, even if the, the ballast water is cleaned, um, if algae forms spores, then it's really difficult to remove those spores. So it's a, it's a big problem. It can be a big problem. But I think in terms of more kind of farmed aquatic produce, I think that's, I think it's a really interesting question. And most of my answer can be related to algae. So where we farm algae, we tend to be, we tend to do it very carefully and wouldn't actually have escaped invasive species so they're species that wouldn't live naturally in the surrounding environment but it's something that the algal cultivation industry um, keeps under control is very and is very aware of um, i don't know about um sort of fish and um crustacea that might be slightly different in terms of farmed aquatic produce maybe Stephen can answer something there um well yeah i mean fish farming has uh, can have quite a few uh, detrimental impacts to creating little dead zones underneath where the those those salmon fish farms are so the idea is to have them out as deep as possible um i think they'd be interesting uh, to test to use those those facilities to test the whole fit, uh, oceanic blue carbon equation so to speak put some sediment traps and see if the natural versus unnatural poos having any effect etc yeah i think i mean i think that there is sort of i mean there's there's definitely evidence of of concerns about escaped salmon um you know i think i think that's a big issue in in the huge worldwide salmon production um and clearly i mean i'm very aware of the examples in europe of escaped um oysters from uh, aquaculture. So it's interesting, Carol, you said, oh, well, we know that the algae won't survive in, in the recipient water, but you do sort of wonder where people might be less careful about disposing of excess algal cultures and make assumptions as they did with the invasive oysters that, well, the invasive oysters will never breed in these waters because it's far too cold. Uh, I think that's what they said about 20 years ago, and there are invasive oysters all over the place in Europe now. Um, so I think I think you know the days you know you know control of anything that's farmed is really really important. But whether whether we're actually implementing the legislation that's there, as as Elisa says, I think it's it's about implementation. Um, 
as much as anything else from a legal no, point no, of view. And I'll just add in, in the chat, as, as Carol said, the specific issue of sheep ballast water was, I think, raised under the Convention on Biological Diversity and then passed on to the International Maritime Organization, where they have developed tools and also guidelines for that particular one, since it was very much in the maritime sector. So that's one way in which the Convention on Biological Diversity identifies a problem, sets the approach, but then it's taken up by a more specialized body uh, to really speak to a particular sector of industry in this case but that doesn't mean that there are many other things related to invasive alien species that still need to be done to the same level of um, specificity so does does inter international law respond rapidly enough to environmental concerns because that's a really good example with um ballast water species i mean Carol and I, you know, we used to work in an institute that, that has spent quite a few years in trying to develop ballast water treatments and was waiting for a long time for the Ballast Water Convention to be um, actually, uh, what is it, subscribed to by sufficient number of countries to actually be enacted. And, and that just took years and years and years and years. So so is is international law fast enough to deal with the environmental problems that we face today whether we have got you know even if we have got great human rights law that we could use is anybody using it so on the dark side international law is never fast enough because you have 196 governments that have to agree but you do want to get to that point eventually like we saw in the climate change because once it's there then it becomes a motor of change and governments really there's all sets of processes to kind of push government to do more um, the Convention on Biological Diversity is, I think, quite fast in reacting and picking up, I think, from scientific findings as well as engagement with indigenous peoples, children and other. And it has been really good as an international forum to raise issues relatively quickly, uh, including, for instance, the whole interaction between biodiversity and marine biodiversity and climate change. Now, the Convention itself can do an, an awful lot then once you go into the details and its constituencies also are say ministries of environment and in some cases you really want to talk with say maritime industry and that's where other institutions are just have a, a more direct um, line of communication and more credibility so that's where things then take a while and it was the same for the climate regime. I mean, the Convention on Biological Diversity has been discussing marine biodiversity and climate, including ocean acidifications for, for years and years. But it's only now that in the climate change regime, we're, we're picking that up. But there's many things that one can do through the law in the meantime. So that's a worthwhile struggle, but it does take a while. But in the meantime, there are other things. And one, I guess, of the most exciting things at the moment is climate litigation. Uh, many of you will have seen how um, youth movements and NGOs are mobilizing, taking governments to court and saying, well, you're not doing fast enough at the international level on climate change, and we're using national courts to oblige governments to do more. And I think there is an opportunity for climate and ocean litigation to come up relatively soon. And again, using international human rights bodies, that would be another way to put pressure on governments. So they have expert, individual experts that can come to countries and look at issues, they have tribunals at courts that again can put pressures on governments and i think it's important to use every single avenue we have from a legal perspective to make that push because you never know where the change will come but we do know we want we need urgent change and so we need to explore all these avenues for change to happen as soon as possible for sure for sure thinking of the uh avenues for change and also maybe thinking of the dimensions of uh, international to local. I'm actually going to move to Stephen, who's already put his hand up before I was even going to ask the question. So Stephen, do you want to comment on that? And then I'll come back to you. I just had a couple of follow ups. To, uh, Adisa, there is the um, Chilean Blue Boat Initiative that's exploring um, legal uh, fines around whale strikes and relating this to uh, damages uh to uh, uh including the value of carbon okay basically and if you uh add that sort of value it sort of changes the dynamics of insurance around boating and everything like that so i'm just uh, raising that uh, uh secondly you know coastal blue carbon has a you know 
or, or let's just say uh, terrestrial carbon, and I'm, I'm, I'm responding, Elisa, to your presentation, um, has had some issues with regarding uh, potential human rights issues uh, related to the um, the use of, of of environments and the exclusion of local uh, of local indigenous people, and you know in, in the coastal environment that's where <laughs> a lot more people live closer to these coastal ecosystems than even the terrestrial ecosystems, and that's why we we put together something called the Blue Carbon Code of Conduct. And I can send also share a link to that as well to, to recognize this issue. And actually in the Paris COP, we actually had a protest against blue carbon because of um, potential uh, of these potential issues that would impact indigenous and local populations. This is something I feel that the blue carbon community has largely overlooked, but I think it's something definitely, especially if the voluntary carbon market moves forward, that we're gonna have to look at. And then, and, and, and Melanie, I'm going to sort of hijack this and, and we can get back to that question and I will answer, of course, but I, I'd like to hijack and put a, a, my own sort of question in to both Carol and Elisa, and that is around the area of iron fertilization and geoengineering and ocean nourish, nourishment, which actually behind the scenes has actually had some quite, I've been hearing some quite little, uh, let's just say, uh, words and discussions, and this is basically on the rise again. And I would I'd first ask um, uh, Carol, from a, a, a phytoplanktonist's point of view, uh, what are the concerns around uh, ocean nourishment and iron fertilization? And then Elisa, from an international law person's point of view, what are your thoughts on how this fits in with international law? I'm sorry, Mel, I need to hijack a little bit, but I'll, I'll, if you can remind me of the question, I'll answer it. But I just want to grab these two experts while we have them. Actually, it's very interesting. I didn't realise that ocean fertilisation was on the agenda again. Um, I was peripherally involved in the first um, suite of iron fertilisation. So I was actually off on maternity leave at the time, but um, I had several colleagues that were involved in those experiments. And um, if you follow the literature, actually a lot of the results from those iron fertilization experiments were inconclusive. Um, for sure, if you um, put in, I mean, they did iron fertilization, they also did phosphorus um, fertilization experiments. And for sure, you can, um, you can get an algal bloom, you can increase the amount of algae, and there's some interesting, um, you know, you can, you can follow that through. But of course, when you do that, you increase the amount of zooplankton. And actually, this kind of leads on to your blue carbon capture, um, you know, with, with whales. But the thing is, zooplankton respire. So they capture that carbon and then they respire that carbon. So there's that. So some of it sinks out of the water column, but some of it is respired back into the atmosphere. And it was this balance. So actually, although they initially they were saying, oh, this is what we need to do. We'll we'll increase the amount of carbon that we capture it wasn't quite as clear cut because it depends on how much then sinks out into the sediment and how much is respired is, is re remineralized basically yeah. um so i'm interested to hear that that is it is back on the agenda because i thought that actually there was real concern about um altering the biodiversity of the oceans which for sure is potentially um, uh, a, a problem and actually that links into a question by um, an anonymous question there about nutrient cycling affected by climate change I don't know like Mel if you want me to answer that kind of that question in there as well because um, well with with um, so it's it's quite interesting or and quite challenging to determine exactly how climate change is altering the biodiversity of the plankton and the phytoplankton in the oceans because it's not quite like on a land-based system where everything is static in the oceans everything's moving so you've got continuous movement of nutrients across the oceans um, but basically as you increase the temperature 
you get increased stratification. And what the phytoplankton need is they need that recycling of the nutrients from the bottom welling mm -hmm. waters, which Stephen was alluding to, and then coming up to actually start with the increasing levels of light particularly in temperate oceans during the spring to then um, start the, the, the basically the spring bloom, which then leads on to the zooplankton. So the nutrient cycling is being affected by climate change in terms of increased stratification. You've also got increased runoff from land in terms of nutrients that are also affecting the amount of productivity in the oceans. And then that can also have detrimental effects when, again, that's remineralized and then you suck out all of the oxygen and you don't get anything growing. You get these big dead zones in the ocean. So, um, you know, there, there are many different things going on where you've got increases in temperature. Then you have increases of CO2, where you have increases of CO2 going into the ocean, you actually get increases in some classes of algae. So you get the diatoms increasing, but on the other hand, because you get changes in the acidification, you get decreasing um, in the in the haptophytes. So you get a change in the biodiversity, which of course then feeds into the types of fish that you're getting. So it's kind of like, we, we really don't know enough um, about the, the way that the biodiversity is changing, but for sure it is changing with all of these factors be, that need to be taken into account. Which also does affect the food chains and potentially people as well, because yeah, absolutely. People, people depend on nutrition, as, as, as Lisa was, was pointing out, particularly yeah. in, in, in sort of global south and in uh, you know, far north as well, uh, indigenous communities, the, the dependence upon seafood is, is huge. Yeah, absolutely. And it seems that, um, that because nutrients are decreasing in the surface waters where there's increased stratification, then you, you get more of these cyanobacteria, the prochlorococcus and cynococcus, which will, we, we, you know, then like you say, the fish will be completely altered by that because they need to be eating diatoms. Yeah. Elisa, do you want to ask, answer the, the second part of Stephen's question and then we'll go back to the audience questions? Yeah, no, it's a great case and it kind of similar in a way to sheep ballast water. So under the Convention on Biological Diversity, there was a very quick reaction to the first, I think, international concerns around ocean fertilization. And we had um, what was called at the time um, soft moratorium on large scale um, experimentation. Um, that remains quite controversial and even the understanding of the legal weight of that language is a matter of, of, of debate, but I think it showed that CBD parties recognized and found consensus on recognizing that some, some of the so-called climate responses can be disastrous for the protection of marine biodiversity and may require very uh, urgent international regulation. Um, similarly to the case of um, sheep ballast water, then the message was sent to a more specialized international agreement, and that's the uh, London Protocol on Dumping from Ships. And there's been long discussions there whether to amend uh, the treaty so as to make sure that ocean fertilization would kind of fall into this idea of uh, dumping as a, as a threat to mar the protection of the marine environment. Um, and I must say that I'm not an expert in that regime, so I don't know the very latest, but it shows the same, the same kind of pathway. Like the Convention on Biological Diversity is um, a very reactive place to, to have some international recognition and action. But once we need then the kind of the next step, kind of harder regulation and really changes in relevant um, industries and actors, often you have to go elsewhere. And so the yeah, the, the action needs to go into different parts of the international um, regulatory regime. Thank yeah. you very much. I think there's a rather similar question there, or a similar sort of theme from, from Andrew Planet again about uh, potential to pump um, nutrient-rich water from the ocean depths uh, using carbon neutral energy to promote carbon sequestration. And, and I think this has the same kind of response as iron fertilization, really, does it not, Carol? Uh, yes and no, because he, he, um, Andrew's talking about carbon neutral energy and uh, yeah, this was actually um, somebody, and I can't remember who it was, it may 
uh, well, I don't want to actually say names, but actually this has has been put forward previously. So it's not a new idea and it's very, it's a very good idea. So people were talking about, um, there were designs of pumps to do exactly that. Now that kind of like phased out, but I, I think it's, you know, something maybe that should be back on the agenda because then you're not adding um, fertilizer into the ocean. You're not adding, you're actually using the nutrients that are already there to, to promote that upwelling of the nutrients. So that might actually be a solution because if um, climate change is reducing that stratification, if you or increasing the stratification, if you can then um, do something to actually increase that upwelling of nutrients again, then I think that's um, a very sensible solution, actually. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Do you think we have enough scientific knowledge to get that balance right between how much you pump up versus how much? I mean, I, I, I to me, this, this, you, you're moving into territory of El Nino and El Nino if you yeah the upwelling wrong yeah no, that that's that's absolutely and also i wonder just how much you would have yeah. to pump up from from below Stephen, um, you look as if you have a thought on that as well well i think um it sounds like we need to have an overview of all of these different types of strategies and interventions um uh, maybe you and environment or, or some other party can can do something like that. I think that's it's definitely high time. I, I believe uh, let's just say that there probably will be some push on uh, one or more of these strategies getting large tested within the next few years. Um, so I think it's going to come on the agenda. Yeah, definitely. But I think you know when you were talking about, I mean, there seem to be more natural approaches that perhaps we should be taking, like thinking about the mesopelagic fish that you talked yeah. about, which are definitely blue carbon conveyors, well, and protecting those rather than trying to look for more technical solutions. I, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think uh, we've, we've already done a lot of geoengineering by overfishing our oceans. Why don't we stop do that and, and let the oceans re re restore itself and restore its, its natural biological carbon functions um, and value that and make sure that these overfishing, that we limit these overfishing in ways that is given credit for. Um, and then, and then, and then see uh, it, what we do with the geoengineering. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it's true, isn't it? It's overfishing. I can see that overfishing is is really impacting on that cycling of carbon. But yeah. then, overriding that, you do have the increases in temperature that are changing the physics of the ocean, which is yeah. preventing the algae from growing to begin with. Which means that you're not going to get the fish. So you're also you have, you know it, it's a several pronged approach, isn't it? it's it's like one of those things you have this sort of uh, mess going on and just like okay stop messing with it leave it alone um maybe you know see if it gets better yeah yeah so we have another question here from uh laura laura marshall um about the algae farming um so what other products can be derived from algae farming beyond animal feed uh, and is there any specific climate and national or international infrastructure required for this type of farming and distribution? Um, and, and Carol, going back to the days when I, I saw one of these bioreactors on a roof, you know, should we all, instead of solar panels, have bioreactors on our roofs uh, and make a personal, personal commitment to do that? Yeah, I think so. So the question were, were there other products from uh, from algae farming? So there are many um, medicinal products, pharmaceutical products that can be developed from um, algae and from other um, marine organisms. Um, Feed and food, or feed seems to be the, the quite an obvious one. It's quite low value. About 20 years ago, and of course, um, Mel will remember when I was also working at PML, there was then, and probably many of the audience do, there was quite a big drive for argyl biofuel, in particular um, biodiesel. Um, and that, again, has, I mean, the states are still doing quite a bit of that. Um, we're doing less so in the UK because we 
figured that actually um, it's very expensive to do so. But as the price of oil goes up or we really need alternatives, um, I'm sure that will come to the forefront again. But so algae can also be used not only for biodiesel, but also um, to um, produce different types of oils for lubricants, um, for, for, for fuel. They can be used to produce um, alcohol, so bioethanol as well as a fuel. Um, they can be um, high temperature liquefaction can be used to produce a, a crude oil. So in, in these cases, they would be considered as kind of carbon neutral. So actually, if you think about it, the um, our, all our oil reserves are based on um, algae that have been buried in sediment for thousands and thousands of years and we're just mining it all too quickly really so if we can grow the algae and then use it for a fuel it becomes it's carbon neutral but it currently it's all about the cost of cultivating algae and getting the the value so we're looking for really high value um components from algae at the moment and there's a there's already a big industry in the um antioxidant and anti-inflammatory pigment called astaxanthin so algae are grown um in enormous quantities in israel and in in hawaii for um these astic, this astaxanthin pigment, which is fed to fish to give it, particularly salmon, to give it its pink color, and also sold in 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 supermarkets. Um, and beta carotene is another one as an antioxidant. But there are several other um, high value products from algae that can be used. So that kind of answers that bit. And then you ask if there's any specific climate, national, international infrastructure required. Well, that would be that would be great. And I would say, yes, there is. Um, but I think it's kind of like private um, industry working with with um, academics in terms of developing it. And there's a real, um, we're on a learning curve as, as to really the best way and the easiest and most economical way to cultivate algae. I don't know if anybody else wants to kind of chip in well, we've there. Got, we've got another couple of questions already. Um, so I'm, I'm just sort of mindful of taking audience questions. Um, what I might come back to, you might want to think about, Carol, is, is, is actually sort of the equity of farming algae for high value things in under a sort of rather westernized umbrella of thinking versus farming algae to provide a nutrient replacement for the overfished fish stocks in, in sort of countries where, where the overfished fish stocks are essential for food. So some of those, those oils could be amazing nutraceuticals and a much better way of getting protein for those people than, yeah. than uh, you know, the fish stocks which are declining and diminishing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, we have a question from somebody who's anonymous. Um, this is one that I quite like. How can we balance the need for activities to mitigate climate change, such as building wind turbines in the ocean and other renewables, with their direct impact on biodiversity, such as seabedding ecosystems? Uh, are there any risk assessment and mitigations or legal fr frameworks which already allow for this? Um, so I don't know if, if, if any of you would like to take that. I don't know, Elisa, if you want to start maybe with the illegal frameworks, I can certainly talk about some of the impacts on biodiversity and I don't know if uh, Stephen can as well. Yeah, no, happy to start, although I think um, maybe I should go last. But once again, the Convention on Biological Diversity has picked that up as part of its ongoing work to assess not only the risks arising from climate change itself to marine biodiversity, but also the risks arising from our climate solutions and, and climate responses to biodiversity, including marine biodiversity. And so, and the, 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 I guess that the short answer is that we need to assess prior prior to undertaking any of these activities, and in fact, any climate change response measure, we should assess uh, potential environmental impacts with particular attention to biodiversity. Of course, impacts on the marine environment are even more complex, and we need to think about ecological connectivity as well as specific impacts on particular species. 
Um, and even more so, particularly on renewables, we also have a whole set of, again, international human rights evidence of how whenever we have uh, unsustainable renewables that has led not only on say displacement in some cases from traditional or sacred grounds for indigenous peoples but sometimes if we ignore the impacts on on biodiversity we may also have knock-on effects on human rights that are dependent on biodiversity such as the right to food or potentially right to health or culture so so the short answer is that we the very minimum we need to do is to have a prior assessment of potential impacts on biodiversity and on those human rights that may be dependent on healthy biodiversity there certainly in the uk there's plenty of uh regulation around offshore renewables and the environmental impacts um which is implemented but uh, it's it's an interesting issue because i think if we're just thinking about uk waters it's going to happen so we just have to make sure we do it well i think but uh, Stephen, I think you wanted to respond as well. Okay, so uh, the first off is, uh, how do we balance the needs for activities? Well, you know, that's through voting and to your, for your politicians because every policy has a benefit and, and minus. I don't know of any policy that doesn't impact somebody or benefit somebody else. Even with the coastal blue carbon um, projects and the voluntary carbon market, some people benefit a little bit more in that community than others you know so there is there are these trade-offs and these trade-offs are what our politicians are supposed to be uh giving having informed information on so that they can make the right decisions uh, presumably okay um and my uh, follow-up to uh, elisa is that um looking at this sort of question you see that there's a need maybe for um, some type of coordination or engagement between a body like the UNFCCC and the CBD, is something like that occurring or is there an effort to, to, to do something like that because ocean solutions may impact biodiversity, etc. How do we how do we manage that? Yeah, is that okay to take the floor again? Yeah, well, uh, I think on, on the um, biodiversity convention side, actually, there's been a lot of development of guidelines that would help um, take an approach that, that you know looks at the trade-offs and try and, and supports governments and decision makers in finding solutions that provide as many benefits both to biodiversity and climate change mitigation and adaptation, or at the very least prevent any climate solutions, including renewables, that will really lead to unacceptable levels of, of biodiversity uh, degradation. That said, there's always been a, let's say, a stream of work, including consensus documents going into the climate change regime and unfortunately not necessarily a response. So once we get into the technical climate negotiations and the climate experts, there's not, there hasn't been so much buy-in of what the Convention on Biodiversity was offering as tools and mechanisms that were meant to support the reaching of both the biodiversity objectives and the climate objectives. There's many reasons why that has not happened, but the reality is that legally, there's no reason why that shouldn't happen. In fact, there's all the reasons for that to happen. Partly maybe the biodiversity and the climate experts working closer together. Partly we have seen more recently that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has finally done work with the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. So once again, maybe once we have that more integrated evidence base, that's where the decision making and the experts come together on that basis. So, so that may be an approach where we might see more, um, more results moving forward. But, but again, no matter what happens internationally, governments where and experts were already able to take that guidance and use it in climate change. But sometimes, as you were saying also, I think, um, Stephen, for the, you know, the negative impacts on indigenous peoples in the, in the carbon projects, we really need to then embed the guidance into the very detailed codes and practices that um, practitioners use rather than looking at the higher level documents. So that's some work that researchers and others need to do to translate the international consensus into reference guides that um, people on the ground and experts would use. And we can do that even before maybe these high level connections are made. Definitely needed. Thank you very much. Well, I think we're pretty much coming towards an end here. There is, there is one last question. I don't know, Carol, if you can give a very quick answer about the viruses and their impact on phytoplankton, uh, or if there's a change in viral diversity 
Uh, I'm not a virologist. Um, I suspect we just don't know enough about viruses in the marine environment because there's still a lot of them are still being discovered. I would say, and I think so, that this goes for some of the other questions and thoughts around this whole subject, is we should also think about what's happening on land and like with climate change. Is there an increase in viruses? You could you could ask the the same question. Um, and the same with, you know, how is climate change altering biodiversity on land versus in the marine environment? Um, so that doesn't really answer your question, Debbie. Um, it's a it's a very interesting question. And, and maybe there is some literature on the area. You could probably do a quick Google search and um, maybe it would answer the question better than than I have. <laughs> OK. Thanks, thanks for that, Carol. Um, a difficult question, but it was. I thought we'd just end with a biology question because this is the Royal Biological Society uh, late, so uh, it seemed like a good one to end on. Thank you very much to all of our panelists. It's been some really nice discussion there, and, and uh, actually it would be lovely to carry on, but I guess I'm not allowed to. Um, Thank you to our listeners for putting their questions in. It's been, been great to have some questions to stimulate the discussion. Uh, and thank you to the Royal Society of Biology and to the Policy Lates Working Group uh, for setting up this event. I hope that everybody has enjoyed today. Um, we certainly have, or at least I certainly have. Um, and I hope you found it interesting. Thank you for joining us. And uh, oh. Yes, I've been reminded there is a uh, there is also a, an event survey. Please could everybody fill it in. I think it's it's in the chat and probably also no, it's just in the chat. Please can you fill in the survey because it helps um, the RSB and others to actually develop the events and to find out what's good, what's bad, what works, what doesn't work. Um, so it's always worth filling in surveys. Thank you very much. And thank you to our panelists. Thank you to the RSB. Thank you to our listeners. And goodbye to you all. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Bye. Great to meet everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.